This section of the chapter will be about respiratory infections. So we've talked about some of these in the infection chapter last quarter. And um, so we're, I don't think I'm going to go through every single one of them that's in the book, but maybe I'll just hit the high points. So upper respiratory infections were all commonly uh, um, familiar with the common cold, also known as infectious rhinitis. It's a viral infection. There are a zillion causative agents out there, or more than 200, um, and it's spread through respiratory droplets. We go on the bus, we sneeze, somebody else inhales it. There you go. Hand washing and respiratory hygiene are the two most important things you can do to prevent your common cold. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face, eyes, mouth until you do wash your hands and cover your mouth when you sneeze and cough or um, better yet cover your mouth um, with your elbow or cover it with a tissue so um, the, of course we treat colds symptomatically um, we can get secondary um, bacterial infections usually caused by streptococci um, we know that the uh, distinguishing factor between the bacterial and the viral are the pur uh, purulent exudate and systemic signs such as fever. So um, if you have a cold, um, be nice to your coworkers. Wear a mask. Wear a mask when you go out or at least cover your um, mouth when you sneeze. So we talked about this a little bit in the infection chapter last quarter, um, the complications of viral respiratory infections. We can get necrosis of that um, respiratory mucosa, making an ideal environment for bacteria to invade. So sinusitis is usually a bacterial infection as compared to a cold. It's usually treated with um, analgesics for headache and pain. Sometimes a course of antibiotics is required to eradicate the infection. Sometimes it's not. Um, laryngotracheobronchitis, also known as croup, is a common viral infection and it's particularly seen in children. Um, the most common cause of organisms are parainfluenza viruses and adenoviruses. And the infection is usually self-limited. So usually they'll have you treat symptomatically um, you'll do the um, uh, moist air, like fill the bathtub up with warm water and moist air, or humidifier, that sort of thing, um, rather than, even though um, it can be really hard for the child, um, you don't want to treat with antibiotics because it's a virus. Um, so influenza, it's a viral infection again. There are three different groups of influenza viruses. Type A is the most prevalent. There are types B and C. As we talked about in the infection chapter last quarter, viruses are constantly mutating. So how can we tell the difference between a cold and a flu? Well, sudden acute onset with fever, marked fatigue, and aching pain in the body. That's your flu. Um, the influenza virus can also cause viral pneumonia. A mild case of influenza can be complicated by secondary bacterial pneumonia, just like we talked about before. So a lot of times deaths in flu ep epidemics result from secondary bacterial pneumonia. The treatment for the flu is usually symptomatic and supportive unless a bacterial infection develops secondarily. Sometimes antiviral drugs can reduce the symptoms in duration and reduce your um, risk of infecting other people. So prevention, cover your mouth, respiratory hygiene, and vaccination. As healthcare professionals, it is so important that we get vaccinated. Um, not to prevent you from getting the flu, but prevent your patients from getting the flu. We could be working with people who are immune compromised, older people, younger people, um, people who can't afford to get the flu, we might be able to get it and survive, but um, you don't want to kill your patient. That, that's probably number one thing. Don't kill your patient. Get your vaccine. Okay, I'm stepping down off my soapbox now. So um, we'll talk about some different types of flu. The type A H1N1 
It's a virus that contains genes from pig, bird, and human flu strains. So this guy's a mutant, right? It has taken some um, a, a, a virus and it's mutated with all these different organisms that it interacted with. It usually affects children and teens younger than 20. Healthy young adults are also at high risk. So some types of flu kill older, weaker people. This is the type of flu that kills younger, healthier people. Um, the high mortality rate is caused by acute respiratory syndrome, pulmonary edema, pneumonia, and a lot of times people have to be hospitalized in, in the intensive care um, when they have H1N1. So um, get that vaccine too. Um, bronchitis is uh, caused by a respiratory um, uh, syncytial virus, or RSV, uh, transmitted by oral droplet. Virus causes necrosis and inflammation in the small bronchi and bronchioles. Um, the signs are wheezing and dyspnea, rapid shallow respirations, cough, rails, chest retractions, fever, and malaise. The treatment is supportive and symptomatic, like it is with most viruses, unless it progresses into a secondary bacterial infection and pneumonia. So pneumonia, here's the thing about pneumonia, it kills a lot of people. <laughs> a lot, pneumonia is what's going to get most of us in the end. Um, it can be caused by viral, bacterial, or fungal agents. Um, it can be out throughout both lungs or consolidated in one lobe. It can cause changes in the interstitial tissue, the alveolar septi, and the alveoli. Um, it can be nosocomial, meaning hospital acquired, or it can be community acquired. So there are a lot of ways to get pneumonia, and um, it's not a good thing to have. So when they talk about um, the different types of pneumonia, and this chart's from the book, obviously, um, basically they will separate it by distribution, whether it's in um, one lobe or all the lobes or scattered in small patches. Um, the causative factor, so whether it's a bacteria, multiple bacteria, viruses, or fungi. Um, the pathophysiology, what part is inflamed. The onset, um, sudden and acute, insidious, or variable, and the signs. So, um, so you'll get different signs with the different types of pneumonia. Um, when I was in high school, I had um, lower pneumonia. Um, it was streptococcus uh, pneumoniae. Um, they gave me an antibiotic to treat it. Um, it was sudden, sudden onset. I had the high fever and chills and the icky cough. And um, so, some of the some of the differences in types can help how they're going to treat it. Obviously, if it's a it's a virus, they're not going to treat it with antibiotics. Um, and if it's uh, multiple bacteria, you might have to have multi um, antibiotics in order to treat it. So um, this, this of course is from the book too and it talks about the different types of pneumonia and what is affected. So bacterial pneumonia, um, it's community based often in healthy young adults caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. That's the one I was just talking about that I had when I was in high school. The infection is usually localized um, inflammation and vascular conduction, um, congestion, and um, the exudate contains fibrin and forms a consolidated mass um, and produces that rusty sputum. So you're coughing up junk, basically, <laughs> if, you, if you want to put it that way. Um, a lot of times the, the pleural area is um, involved and it can be um, irritated. And the infection may spread to the pleural cavity, which is called empyema. You get the sudden onset, the systemic signs, high fever, fatigue, and leukocytosis, dyspnea, tachypnea, and tachycardia, pleural pain, that's from the pleural involvement, rails from um, the stuff in your lungs, productive cough with that rusty colored sputum, and sometimes confusion and disorientation. Bronchopneumonia is a diffuse pattern of infection in both lungs, 
Um, several species of microorganisms may be the cause. So a lot of times they have to do a culture and sensitivity of the sputum to decide which microorganism it is and how can they kill it. Um, the inflammatory exudate forms in the alveoli. You can imagine how that would interfere with gas exchange. Um, the onset tends to be insidious. Instead of that high fever, you get a moderate fever and cough and rails. So a lot of people might say, oh, I've just got a cold. I'm doing fine. But now they're coughing up yellow or green sputum. Um, they have to be treated with antibiotics, but you better culture and do a culture and sensitivity on that yellow or green sputum and figure out which antibiotic is going to do the trick. Legionnaire's disease, it's caused by Legionella pneumophilia. It thrives in warm, moist environments. It's often a nosocomial infection, so acquired in the hospital. It's difficult to identify. It requires a special culture medium. Um, untreated infections can cause severe congestion and consolidation, necrosis in the lung, and you could die from it. So when it was first discovered in the 70s, it was discovered in an American Legion Convention. That's why it's called Legionnaire's disease, and, and several people died from it. So primary atypical pneumonia is a bacterial pneumonia caused by mycoplasma um, pneumoniae, common in older children and young adults, transmitted by aerosol. So in the air, frequent cough, um, antibiotic therapy, the viral form is caused by influenza A or B, adenoviruses or RSV, um, an unproductive cough, hoarseness and sore throat, headache, mild fever, and malaise. So a lot of these atypical things, they seem like a cold to begin with. You go, oh, I've got a cold. But the systemic um, effects are usually the things that um, differentiate a cold from one of these atypical pneumonias. The infection can vary greatly in severity, in severity but it's usually self-limiting. So this isn't one of the ones that usually kills you. <laughs> thank goodness, or that you need um, aggressive treatment for. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, it's an acute respiratory infection, um, and the, it has a microbe that's a virus, it's SARS-associated coronavirus. Um, it's transmitted by respiratory droplets or close contact, headache, fever, muscle aches, chills, anorexia, possibly diarrhea. Um, those are the first signs. Later on, you get the dry coughed, marked dyspnea, areas of interstitial congestion, hypoxia, and you might need to be put on ventilator. Um, for And it's, it's a virus. Don't you hate that when it's a virus? So it's treated with antivirals and glucocorticoids for the inflammation. There's a really high fatality rate, so this is something that you need to get treated for right away. So risk factors that are monitored to prevent outbreaks are travel to endemic or epidemic areas and close contact with someone who traveled to those areas. So um, the, a lot of times they um, diagnose it. There's a cluster of undiagnosed atypical pneumonia cases. Um, sometimes it's... Um, in a certain area, like people are all working together and they all have these atypical pneumonias. And then they quarantine people until the until everybody's clear of the infection, which is a really good idea. Tuberculosis, we talked about a little bit in the infection chapter. It's caused by specific um, bacteria. It's transmitted by oral droplets. And occurs more frequently with people living in crowded conditions people who are in a state of immunodeficiency, malnutrition, alcoholism, conditions of war, because a lot of times um, crowded conditions and malnutrition are part of that, um, chronic disease, so you, that's your immunodeficiency, or HIV infection, that's also immunodeficiency. So its, it's usual cause is that, is that bacteria. Um, it's somewhat resistant to drying in many disinfectants. So. A lot of bacteria, they get on surfaces, they dry up, and they're not infective anymore. Um, tuberculosis, on the other hand, can sit there for a while, and it's somewhat resistant to drying, and so you disinfect the area and you don't kill it, and it's just waiting there for someone. So um, it can survive in dried sputum for weeks. It can be destroyed by ultraviolet light, heat, alcohol, um, 
glutar, uh, glutaraldehyde, sorry, and formaldehyde. So those are some pretty serious disinfectants that aren't just sitting around, um, you know, in a lot of places. So um, when you when you have tuberculosis, the um, normal neutrophil response doesn't occur and your cell mediated immunity is normally protecting you from t tuberculosis. It primarily affects the lungs but you can, it can also invade other organs. So a lot of times people that have been in areas where there's a high level of tuberculosis might have a, um, an abnormal TB test um, just because their, their immune system was um, exposed to it but they were protected from it by their normal immunity. It's the people that have compromised um, immune systems that have trouble with it. So the primary infection when the organism first enters the lungs, it's engulfed by macrophages in the lungs and you get a local inflammatory response. And that's your cell mediated immunity. If that's inadequate, then those guys start to reproduce and they begin to destroy your lung tissue and that form of the disease is very contagious. So if the cell mediated immunity is adequate, so our macrophages work like they're supposed to, some bacilli migrate to the lymph nodes um, and they form, they, they form a granuloma which is like a walled off um, area of active live bacilli. So that's what they're looking for on a chest x-ray. They, they're looking for that tubercle. That names the disease, the tuberculosis. Um, they can remain in, viable in that dormant stage for years. So um, if the individual's resistance and immune responses are high, the bacilli remain walled off. Um, if you have that primary latent infection, um, you're asymptomatic, you're not transmitting the, the disease. The secondary or reinfection with TB occurs when your cell mediated immunity is impaired because of stress, malnutrition, HIV infection, or age. And then the mycobacteria begin to reproduce and infect the lung. And then you have active TB which can be spread to others. So it can be dormant for years and years until something happens and then it becomes active again. So we, d we did talk a little bit, we talked about this in the infection chapter, but this is just another um, chart of what can happen depending on whether you have low or high resistance. So um, there's miliary or extra, uh, extra pulmonary tuberculosis which is a rapidly progressive form or common in children less than five years. That's where it gets into the other tissues besides the lung tissue and it happens early. Um, so the, lesion, the lesions aren't found in the lungs, so you're not coughing out droplets and it's not contagious. But the common symptoms include weight loss, failure to thrive, and other infections um, because their immune system is depressed. Um, so when you see those weight loss, failure to thrive, um, other infections, you can see how this disease could be masked. It c you could say, oh, well, it's something else. You know, so it, it might take them a while to figure out what it is. Um, in active TB, the organisms are actively multiplying. They're not walled off, like in the cystic form. Um, they are the infection is causing large open areas in the lungs or cavitation and it promotes spread into other parts of the lung and the pleural cavity. So um, that shows up on a radiograph, the um, cavitation, and you get coughing and sputum. Um, so the disease in this form is highly contagious when there's close personal contact over a period of time. So if somebody in your family had it, or if you were, like in the video that we watched in the infection chapter, if you were in jail with somebody who had it, you couldn't avoid it. So this is the um, picture of the cavitation. All the little arrows are pointing to areas of cavitation in the lung. Usually the, the lung is brown and um, glossy looking, sort of. That white area, that is the damaged area. So 
The first exposure or primary infection is diagnosed by the um, positive TB test. So we've all had those, those tuberculin skin tests, um, where they inject a little bit of the um, stuff into your arm, and then they look and see if you have a reaction to it. Um, active infections, um, they do sputum tests and chest x-rays and sputum culture and sensitivity. The treatment involves long-term treatment with a combination of drugs. So it's from 6 to 12 months you have to be on antibiotics. When I was in PTA school, there were two people in my class that tested positive on their tuberculin skin test. One of them um, was originally from a foreign country um, where tuberculosis is more common. The other one had served in the military in Afghanistan and they both tested positive um, in that tuberculosis skin test and they both had to be on antibiotics for 6 to 12 months. So the effective treatment requires monitoring and follow-up and is expensive. You know, antibiotics aren't cheap, especially the ones that kill the bad stuff. <coughs> it's becoming a, a, an increasingly serious problem because of homelessness and crowding in shelters, HIV infection, lack of health care, and multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So histoplasmosis is a fungal infection um, and the spores can be inhaled in dust particles. A lot of times it's, uh, it's an opportunistic infection that can be asymptomatic in the first stages. In the second stage, you get um, granuloma formation and necrosis. <clears throat> so cough, fever, and night sweats are the symptoms in the second stage. And since it's a fungal infection, it has to be treated by antifungal agents. And back to the talking about the different types of microorganisms, um, fungi are euk eukaryotes, bacteria are prokaryotes, and so antifungal agents are pretty... Um, serious. They can damage your own cells, not just the fungus cells. Anthrax is a bacterial infection by a gram-positive bacillus. Um, it can be inhaled, causing flu-like symptoms and severe acute respiratory distress. Um, shock can be caused by release of toxins from the bacillus and it has high fi um, fatality rates. It's treated with um, an antimicrobial agent, which is called cipro. I got. <laughs> I always have trouble pronouncing these. Ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin. Okay, you can read it without me pronouncing it. Anyway, it's a um, it's a tough one to kill. Um, there's an animal um, vaccine that's available, and there are certain people that are because of their professions, they might be exposed to anthrax, and the um, vaccine is recommended for people who might be exposed to it. Um, most of us aren't exposed to it, um, even if we listen to heavy metal music, and so um, it's, it's not a common vaccine that um, usually we have to get.